Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session on genes and reproduction. And as you have heard uh, from Antonio in his masterful introduction this afternoon, uh, I think that genes are permeating many aspects uh, of our work. So I think it's a timely choice uh, to look at uh, the genetic aspects uh, of uh, reproduction. Uh, the first speaker, so the program has changed slightly from what is published online. The first speaker is Patricia Diaz-Gimeno, who will uh, uh, talk about the genes uh, and implantation. I'm sure uh, that she will shed some light on the usefulness uh, of the ERA test. Okay, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to such an interesting symposium. This is my disclosure. Okay, we are going to talk today about genes and implantation. And talking about genes and implantation, uh, it's the same as talking about gene expression signatures because there are thousands of genes involved in endometrium and implantation, is talking about transcriptomics. And talking about implantation, is about talking about endometrial receptivity, window of implantation, endometrial function, endometrial timing. endometrial dating. Then, after a brief introduction, uh, we are going to expand all these terms and talking about the genes that are involved uh, in, in the window of implantation timing. It means if the window of implantation, implantation is, is on time. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, how uh, the window of implantation is working, the endometrial function, and finally, we are going to talk about how these gene signatures are changing the endometrial factor evaluation in assisted reproductive treatments. Uh, I think it's very important to mention that the endometrium, uh, why the endometrium is important, uh, because it is the place where the life begins, uh, is where the blastocyst implants and start the embryo development, placentation, and vascularization. The second reason, uh, because the endometrium is important, is because once the embryo factor is controlled, the endometrium is the main place to look for idiopathic infertility. And finally, uh, the endometrium is important towards precision reproductive medicine. We need to improve uh, the live birth rate at the first attempt uh, for safer and cost-effective assisted reproductive treatments. We need to control uh, all the actors in the reproductive medicine process, and of course, the uh, maternal environment is very important. Uh, all of you know about what is the window of implantation. At the end, the classical definition is a period of time uh, where the uh, endometrium is ready uh, to implant, and it's around uh, between 20 and 24 uh, days in the menstrual cycle. And finally, in, in the introduction, I am going to talk about uh, transcriptomics. Transcriptomics is to, to look for the genes that are working together uh, for undergoing the menstrual cycle changes. Then this uh, high throughput technology is giving us the opportunity uh, to study the endometrium from a multi-parametric, multi multi-dimensional uh, perspective, giving us lots of, of information. Then, if we are collecting biopsies, we can study uh, the gene expression pattern uh, throughout the menstrual cycle. Uh, here you have the, cl the classical heat map, where the genes, are in, the genes that are in red are upregulated, uh, are highly expressed, 
and the genes that are in blue are downregulated, are uh, low, low stress. Then we can have a pattern of what is happening uh, throughout the menstrual cycle. Also, we can study the relationship between genes. This is a classical network, network where genes are uh, uh, working together for performing functions. And also, uh, we can uh, evaluate in the window of implantation using artificial intelligent algorithms for classifying the endometrium in the window of implantation. Okay, then, uh, uh, which are the genes involved to measure endometrial timing? Uh, dating the, um, the endometrium is classical. In the 50s, Noyes uh, established uh, eight histological parameters. Uh, based on these parameters, uh, we were able to say if the endometrium was on phase or not. Uh, and we know, all of, all of us, that the window of implantation is a complex and a multifactorial trait. Also, if we are researching the window of implantation from the histological point of view, we need lots of parameters to characterize the, the, how the tissue is, is working and is changing. And in the, in the first part of the 21st century, uh, gene expression was proposed as a technology also to uh, date in the endometrial tissue as an OGS criteria, but in a, in a high throughput way. Then, in, this is a, a paper one in 2004 from Paran Palan, the group of Peter Rogers. And as you can see here, um, each point is representing an uh, endometrial biopsy, the transcriptome of each endometrial biopsy from each we, uh, woman. Then you can see as proliferative samples, early secretory, mid secretory, late secretory, are clustering from proliferative to late secretory, performing a, a clock. Then we know that we can also understand how the, 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 the endometrium is changing using uh, transcriptomics. Then in 2011, we published for first time the endometrial receptivity analysis that was performed in EB Foundation. And we were able to use a gene expression signature of 238 genes and combining with machine learning algorithms, that is a part of artificial intelligence, we were able to classify the window of implantation, the endometrial timing. Then uh, this is again a principal component analysis where each point is representing uh, the transcriptome uh, from the 238 genes. Then proliferative uh, endometriums are here, uh, pre-receptive, receptive, pro receptive And that we have learned using this, this kind of classification is that some women that are in progesterone plus flies days are uh, advanced, sorry, delayed or, or advanced. But one, one of the most useful uh, things that we can do with transcriptomics is using the classical clinical parameters and also the transcriptomic information, try to stratify patients. What means stratify patients? Uh, we have, a, for example, in this example, we have the classical window of implantation. We have patients group according to they are on time, they are on the window of implantation, but as you can see here, are molecularly heterogeneous. You are believing that you have a homogeneous group, but from the molecular point of view, this group is heterogeneous. Then, using transcriptomics and artificial intelligence algorithms, we can stratify. For example, here we can distinguish uh, four different profiles in the window of implantation. And this was that we did in 2017, and we were able to split the window of implantation in four different transcriptomics profiles. Then here in, Mondi, in more detail, we were able to create a new taxonomy of the window of implantation thanks to transcriptomics and classical uh, menstrual cycle parameters. Uh, the original window of implantation was divided in four different transcriptomic profiles. In this case, LPR, RR, LR, and PS. And then we uh, did the clinical follow-up and we were able to uh, define that were two profiles, the the LPR and the RR that uh, had a, a high pregnancy rate and a very high also ongoing pregnancy rate. And the, the most interesting thing was we discovered a late receptive profile that has the same pregnancy rate but 
uh, a low uh, uh, ongoing pregnancy rate and a high number of biochemical miscarriages. Then we have learned transcriptomics profiles according to endometrial timing are associated to reproductive outcomes. Then we were, we were working during the last five years to re, uh, optimize also the gene signatures that are, that are involved in endometrial timing. Then was in 2022, we published a new signature based on 73 genes that was called transcriptomic endometrial uh, signature. Then we were able to stratify uh, very accurate the window of implantation transcriptomic profiles. In this case, were two different profiles that had the, the highest pregnancy rates. And of course, we use, uh, as always, because we are specialized on that, <laughs> artificial intelligence algorithms. And that we were in this work also very interesting uh, is we were trying to understand which signatures are really good biomarkers for endometrial timing. And we discovered that most of combinations are, uh, are predictive for uh, distinguishing the, the endometrial uh, cyclic changes. And we also we were trying uh, uh, random signatures from the, from the genome, combining randomly. And the conclusion was uh, the menstrual cycle progression cyclic changes generate a strong effect in gene expression, and most of the gene combinations, signatures, are accurate biomarkers for endometrial dating. Okay, till this point, we are um, able to distinguish uh, easily uh, how the endometrium is changing, and using lots of combinations of genes is possible. Then, uh, now we are going to talk about if the window of implantation is really functional or not. The window of implantation could be on time or not, but could be pathological by itself. Then, in 2018, we proposed two potential causes of implantation failure. Uh, we were using, this study was done retrospectively, using uh, a sample repository where gene expression data was available, uh, and gene expression omnibus, and we were working with a data set of implantation failure patients and controls. Uh, and using artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, we contrast the hypothesis of two potential causes, uh, one related to endometrial progression, endometrial timing, for the, the origin of endometrial uh, implantation failure, uh, then the endometrium could be displaced or on time, and another model uh, that is testing the endometrial function, the pathology, the disruption. Then the endometrium could be pathological or, or normal. Uh, combining these, these algorithms, uh, we, we understood that we need to remove the menstrual cycle timing for being able to distinguish the pathology, because if not, the cyclical endometrial changes are so strong, and then we cannot distinguish if the endometrium is really functional or not. Uh, then, uh, we were focused on developing a new gene signature uh, able to distinguish only pathology, only endometrial function, no timing. Okay? Then we were able to discover an endometrial failure risk signature composed by 122 genes. Uh, with, and we were able to distinguish uh, good prognosis and bad prognosis endometrium, poor, poor prognosis and good prognosis endometria with a 92% of accuracy, 96% of sensitivity, and 84% of specificity. Then, distinguishing good prognosis and poor prognosis, uh, we, have a, a, we, we did the clinical follow-up in the single embryo transfer after biopsy collection with good quality embryos, embryos from PGTA or embryos uh, from donors less, less than 35 years old. And that we discovered was uh, 49 uh, samples were classified as good, as good prognosis, 137 as poor prognosis. And when we did the follow-up, uh, the, the pregnancy rate and light birth was uh, significantly higher in the group of good prognosis, close to 8% and 98%. Uh, 8 and also the... Um, clinical miscarriages and the biochemical miscarriages were also high in, in poor prognosis profiles. Okay, 
uh, till this point, how we can use all these discoveries in gene expression signatures for improving uh, and, and changing uh, the endometrial factor evaluation in arts. We proposed in 2018, when we did our study retrospectively using the, the data set uh, of Maglon Group, we proposed a clinical algorithm. The clinical algorithm, when, when, when we are analyzing the window of implantation, was to consider both causes. It means uh, the endometrium could be displaced or could be on time. Uh, also, the endometrium could be uh, independently of if it's displaced or on time, could be pathological or could be normal. Then, combining both causes, uh, we have different possible phenotypes. The endometrium could be uh, displaced and pathological or on time and pathological. In both, causes, in, in both cases, we have pathology. Then we need to investigate new treatments. In the case the endometrium is only displaced but is normal, is not pathological, perhaps, perhaps, personalized the embryo transfer in this, only in these uh, patients could work. Okay? And if we are uh, using this combination, we have also a normal endometrium from the pathological point of view and non-displaced, then the origin is not this cause, it should be another. Others. Then we we were working uh, in the last four years in designing and, and performing a tool and, and a software for being able to classify the window of implantation uh, using our TET signature because it's more accurate, only using 73 genes. Uh, we were able to evaluate the displacement and using the signature endometrial failure, uh, endometrial, uh, failure uh, risk signature, we were able uh, to distinguish um, good prognosis uh, from poor prognosis. And we know that we should remove the endometrial timing for being able to see the endometrial pathology. And finally, this is our, 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 our last results. We have a cohort of 186 patients. Then we have classified these patients according to these models, according to displacement and according to good and poor prognosis. And as you can see here, when we are doing the displacement, uh, the displaced population and the on-time population has non-significant differences in pregnancy rate, like the rate, clinical miscarriages, or biochemical miscarriages. However, when we are considering the, the, the pathology, we are obtaining a significant difference, and, and we have also three times more higher risk of endometrial failure, considering also biochemical pregnancy or implantation failure in the patients with good, good, with good um, bad prognosis. Poor, sorry. This is so here and also here. And finally, for finishing my talk, uh, some take-home messages. Endometrial factor evaluation in fertility is more complex than dating the endometrial tissue in a period of time in the mid-secretory endometrium. Transcriptomic stratification allows us to distinguish between endometrial progression cyclic changes and endometrial function. To identify these two aspects is necessary for precision medicine in IVF. We need further research with higher sample size for population inference and validations. There is a lack of regulation in the application of genomic tools uh, to the clinical practice. And we need to learn how to treat patients guided by these transcriptomics clinical support tools. Uh, I would like to thank my research, my daddy research team in the Foundation, especially Patricia Sebastian Leon, that is the postdoctoral researcher that is working with me in all these uh, discoveries. Uh, all my colleagues in, in EV clinics that are working with me in all these studies, and especially Professor Antonio Pellicer. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, I think that um, Dr. Hibino needs to catch a plane, so uh, we are going to hold uh, a brief discussion right now. Is that okay with you? And then proceed with the rest uh, of the session. So is there any question? If not, let me ask you a brief question. 
Uh, how do you explain all, all of this controversy on the use of Eratest uh, in clinics? I mean, uh, it doesn't seem to be going much further than uh, what has been done so far, but maybe you can give us a different perspective. Okay. Um, I have been not, not talking really about the personalization of embryo transfer. I mean, one, one thing is these tools are able to measure that are, are able to measure. Another thing is which interbase intervention are you doing for changing this? As I show you, uh, the profiles after the clinical follow-up seems that are correlated to, to clinical significance. But how you are changing if a, if a woman is not really. The solution is to change the progesterone hours or could be another solution. I think uh, this is that now is uh, in controversy. I mean, uh, perhaps it's not to personalize the progesterone hours or, 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 the, or, the, or the administration of uh, gonadotropin. Uh, perhaps the solution could be another intervention or also the population. You should stratify better the population for knowing which patients could be benefit. I think this is the problem now with ERA. And with all these tools, at the end, uh, you as a clinician, uh, I'm sorry for, for giving you the, 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 I don't know how to say this, but at the end, I think it's very important to know, to, to research well how to treat these patients. Thank you. Also, thank you for sticking to your allotted time so nicely. Okay, Thanks. Thank you. So, good evening. I'm Andrea Garolla from Padua. Thank you for inviting me and andrologists uh, in this session. Uh, I know that Andrea Borini wanted me in the English session because he knows my uh, Anglo Veneto, <laughs> that is very far from uh, the, the Anglo Saxon languages. Um, uh, today we will talk about uh, genes and sperm function, and uh, uh, I noticed that uh, there are few speeches, a few talk about the mail. Uh, I suggest. Uh, in the future to, to improve this. It seems uh, in the congresses, uh, in the recent congresses on uh, uh, reproduction, it seems that uh, the decrease uh, of uh, talk about the male parallel the decrease of the, the number of sperm that the WHO suggests us. So uh, I, I, I suggest to Global Research Alliance in the future to improve this. The sperm is uh, important. Uh, Jackson Brown, Professor Brown, told us that uh, uh, this cell is able to uh, change the uh, pregnancy rate, the delivery rate. And uh, uh, also Professor Pellissier told us that we have to improve the study of the male factor. Uh, but uh, we have uh, very few studies, very few uh, talk about uh, experimental studies on the sperm. So I'm talking to young people uh, that are in this room and I invite th them to uh, perform these studies together with us. I believe that uh, if uh, we, we will uh, make uh, more research in it, uh, we, can, we will uh, increase the 34% of uh, uh, pregnancies that uh, uh, at uh, international level we have. Uh, this is uh, to change the view, uh, as Bob Edwards told us. We have not to be at the beginning of the end, but at the end of the beginning. So uh, this is the reason, because uh, uh, today there is Alberto Ferlin, uh, that uh, is the perfect person for this, uh, for this speech. We, he will talk about uh, genes and sperm function. He is the chief of uh, our uh, unit of andrology and reproductive medicine. And uh, he is, uh, you know very well, one of the most uh, famous uh, uh, andrologists uh, and endocrinologists in the world about uh, 
reproduction. Uh, and so I am very happy because he is my friend and also proud to invite to, 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 to present him. Please, Alberto. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea, for the kind presentation. And thank you, obviously, to uh, Andrea Borini and Giovanni Coticchio for inviting me. So now we move to the sperm and we look uh, in uh, some details, uh, uh, not the classical genetics of male fertility or male infertility, but some new aspects related to the uh, sperm function, not only sperm quantity. So we are talking about this very small cell now. We, uh, uh, before uh, we listen about this uh, large cell, uh, the oocyte, now we are moving on this small cell, but it is very important, you know, because not only it is produced by one body and uh, it acts uh, on another body. So he takes a long journey, this uh, cell, from the male tract, from the testicle, uh, about three months to be produ to produced in the testicle, and then a long journey into the seminal uh, tract of the male, and then another long journey in the, se in the uh, genital tract of the female. So this is very small cell, is, uh, as you well know, produced uh, uh, after a long uh, uh, and very specialized uh, uh, process called the spermatogenesis, you know very well that, uh, include uh, at least uh, uh, two very important phases, the spermatogonial mitosis, the spermatogonial stem cell uh, divisions, and the meiosis, and the third most important uh, process is a spermiogenesis, so the, um, uh, the passage from uh, spermatids to mature spermatozoa, you well know uh, the very important uh, process that happened uh, from uh, spermatids to mature spermatozoa. So at the final end, we will have this very small and uh, apparently very simple cell. But, uh, if you look uh, in more details, you can understand that to have this uh, small cell with its complexity and its uh, complex function, the uh, genetic control and the genetic pathway, molecular pathways involved are really very, very important. Uh, we will focus uh, uh, during this relation not to classical genetics, so related to DNA uh, of uh, the sperm, or uh, uh, DNA that we extract from blood to, for classical genetic testing, but to uh, some neglected function or uh, genetic aspects of the sperm that are uh, the so-called the fuel and the enzymes of the mitochondria, and the transmission and the wheels of this car, that is the flagellum and the cilia. Uh, but we also have to remember that to have a fully com competent sperm, uh, there are different phases, different molecular mechanisms, and uh, this is just a small example of what happens for uh, uh, capacitation and for motility. So there are many, many ion channels, ion transporters, and different uh, molecular mechanisms regulating sperm motility and sperm capacitation. And obviously, Giovanni uh, well showed us before, the very, very complex mechanism regulating the uh, fertilization. So uh, please remember this final maturation process from spermatids to mature spermatozoa because there are a number of morphological and functional uh, differentiation in this phase that are very important for subsequent uh, sperm function. Uh, so for example, you know very well that during the transition from uh, spermatids to uh, mature sperm, you have a, uh, we have a very important process that has a substitution of histones with proteins and the condensation of DNA and so on. But we also know that uh, during this phase, there is also the establishment of uh, uh, epigenetic control that are very important not only for sperm function, but also for embryo development. Uh, so, classically, we know that uh, male reproduction, and in particular fertility and testis function, is uh, highly genetically controlled. About 2,000 or 3,000 genes are needed for uh, normal reproduction. Uh, so, it is quite evident that, theoretically, uh, 
uh, any mutation in one of these genes could uh, be responsible for infertility. Uh, we also know that uh, classical genetics uh, says that about 10 or 15 percent of male infertility is due to genetic factors. And importantly, uh, we also know that genetic factors contribute to uh, the most important uh, diagnostic categories uh, of uh, male infertility. That means quantitative defects of spermatogenesis, so genetic defects that uh, mainly uh, alters the spermatogonial differentiation or mitosis, so the number of stem cells and the number, therefore, of mature sperm, but also qualitative sperm defects such as uh, astinotospermia or alteration of the flagellum and so on, the obstructive forms. We all know that cystic fibrosis, for example, is uh, one of the most important causes of uh, uh, obstructive form, in particular of the absence of uh, uh, vas deferens. But also we know that there are many, many genes, probably hundreds or, uh, yes, hundreds of genes controlling uh, the uh, endocrine system, that, that means the hypothalamic pituitary testicular endocrine function. And I'm always very interested about this parallelism. You know that the number of genes that are uh, needed for uh, testis function is the, uh, among the highest in our body and uh, the, um, the other uh, organs that need a so number, high number of genes is the brain. And it, it is something interesting because there are a lot of similarities, no joke, Andrea, and there are a lot of similarities between testis function and uh, um, central nervous system function, but also on the sperm cell and the neurons. This is a very interesting study comparing uh, at the proteome level the number of proteins that are expressed in the sperm and in the, uh, in the um, neurons, and you see that many, many genes are commonly expressed by the sperm and the neurons. So not only the test is one of the uh, in, our, uh, in our body, one of the organs that express the higher number, the highest number of genes, but also the similarities between brain and testes is, is, uh, uh, is very high. So apart from some jokes, uh, the testes and the brain are very similar. So uh, we also know now that uh, we, we, <laughs> we, we know uh, many genes that act specifically in the different phases of spermatogenesis. For, for example, these are uh, a very small list of genes that uh, uh, affect the spermatogonial proliferation or uh, the meiotic division or the spermatid differentiation. And also these are uh, some genes, not uh, obviously all the genes we know, regulating uh, the hypothalamic pituitary testicular endocrine axis. And again, here is a recent review showing uh, how many genes act at the different level from the endocrine level, uh, testicular level, post-testicular level, and so on. Just for example of uh, uh, how fast the research in this uh, field is going. This review in uh, um, okay, 2019, identify uh, 92 genes that are surely, that are va validated genes uh, with potential uh, effect on, female, on male fertility. Okay, so in 19, 92 genes. The same authors, two years later, so in 1921, performed the same review and identify 120 genes reporting the literature that are validated genes responsible for male infertility. So in just two years, more than 30 genes have been identified with possible role in male infertility. And where these genes, uh, or what these genes cause? And you see that the number of genes, the total number of genes, are responsible for different uh, kind of uh, male infertility. So the most important categories is uh, 67 genes uh, responsible for endocrine alteration of the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis, so the so-called hypogonotropic hypogonadism. That is not, however, one very frequent cause of infertility, but another 
17 genes are responsible of uh, defects, especially defects in the flagellum, in the cilia. Uh, 14 genes uh, in, uh, as a cause of non-obstructive alzospermia or severe oligospermia, and another 14 genes are responsible for uh, morphological alteration of spermatozoa, so called uh, multiple uh, uh, morphological abnormalities uh, of the sperm flagella. So you see that there are a lot of genes, and uh, these genes uh, uh, may be responsible for different causes of male infertility. Uh, this is the classical genetics, okay? So genetics of the nuclear DNA. But now we will move uh, briefly on uh, other things uh, uh, that uh, we think are very important uh, and things for which uh, we are uh, um, performing different studies. So the genetics of mitochondria, uh, DNA, epigenetics, no, I don't tol talk about epigenetics too long, okay, and the telomeres. Uh, the most important thing is that if you correctly apply uh, in the clinical practice uh, very few genetic tests, very few genetic tests, you can always uh, identify a large number of men uh, uh, with a genetic cause. For example, if you correctly apply, uh, oh no, this is not, okay. If you correctly apply the karyotype uh, analysis or Y chromosome microdeletion analysis or cystic fibrosis uh, uh, analysis and so on, so very few clinical, very few tests that are clinically approved to be used in the routine, routine uh, practice, these are from the Italian guidelines, uh, for the management of male infertility, you can identify a large number of men with potential uh, genetic factors. For example, if you correctly apply the karyotype analysis, you just identify 10 or 15 percent of men with non-obstructive alzospermia with some chromosomal abnormality. If you correctly apply white chromosome microdeletion analysis, again, you find uh, about 5-10 percent of men among those with non-obstructive atospermia and severe oligotospermia. If you correctly apply the so-called partial AZFC deletion or GRGR deletion on the Y chromosome, again, you uh, identify about 3-4% uh, of men with oligotospermia, and so on. Uh, the androgen receptor gene in very selected patients. Uh, this is just an example of uh, if, um, a recent paper from our group uh, showing that in more than uh, 8,000 men with infertility, if you correctly identify the patient, uh, you can find an androgen receptor gene mutation uh, in about 3% of the cases. Uh, but also TEX11 and many other genes, the CFTR, CFTR gene mutation in men with congenital absence of us deferent and so on. So if you correct apply, apply very few genetic tests, you can identify uh, um, a very large number of men with uh, uh, genetic problems. And these are uh, the Italian guidelines showing you where when and in which patient you have to apply karyotype analysis, Y chromosome microdeletion, and so on. So the classical genetic analysis in, in this patient. What it is important is now we moved from this approach. So karyotype analysis, Y chromosome analysis, androgen receptor analysis, but now in our clinical practice, we use gene panel for the different categories of male infertility. So this is very important, not the male infertility as a whole, but by selecting correctly the, uh, the different patients. For example, we have, we have this uh, uh, gene panel analysis uh, when the problem is uh, primary testicular disorder uh, and all, all different other uh, problems. Uh, astinothospermia. Astinothospermia is very particular because uh, we know that there are a lot of genes regulating sperm motility, obviously, and this is related both to mitochondrial function for energy and the flagellum. So we have, may have problems in genes uh, of the mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial proteins, and proteins of the uh, flagellum. And these are some of the genes with known mutations causing uh, low sperm motility. But you also know that there are a lot of genes uh, with mutations reported in uh, humans 
regulating uh, ion channels, ion transporters. So what do I show you the before that are important for sperm motility, sperm capacitation, and uh, the fertilization ability? And you probably also know that uh, <coughs> last year, uh, one of these uh, uh, ion channels uh, was uh, identified as a potential uh, mechanism for male uh, contraception because you just block this uh, uh, specific uh, adenylate cyclase and you specifically block temporarily the sperm motility. So this research is important not only to identify new causes of male infertility, but also, for example, to identify new potential approach for male contraception. Uh, many years ago, Daniela, we published this paper on uh, uh, DNA, uh, DNA gene mutation. This was one of the first uh, paper showing that uh, mutations in uh, proteins of the cilia uh, in the flagellum may be important uh, as a cause of infertility and especially uh, for sperm motility. But now we, you look that the number of genes that are now, uh, mutations uh, that are responsible uh, for male, uh, for uh, uh, sperm uh, motility uh, uh, relating to alteration in uh, uh, proteins of the flagellum, flagellum is very, very high. And so called also the multiple morphological alteration and MAF uh, of the sperm flagella is a specific diagnostic category. And also in these cases, there are uh, today 18 genes that are clearly uh, related to this abnormality. So again, in our clinical practice in Padova, we have a gene panel for astenodospermia and uh, MAF, because only with this approach you can identify uh, uh, potentially a large number of men with different uh, mutations. Uh, the last one minute, two minutes, okay. Uh, three minutes, uh, thank you. Um, the last three minutes uh, uh, to show you some uh, uh, very preliminary, but I think uh, interesting results about another chapter that is related to mitochondrial DNA uh, and uh, mitochondrial protein, gene of the, uh, of the um, uh, proteins of the uh, mitochondria, because you know that uh, uh, mitochondria are uh, essential for the sperm, but uh, not only for ATP formation, so for motility, but also because uh, they produce reactive uh, uh, oxygen species that are necessary for the sperm, for different uh, functions of the sperm, such as capacitation, acrosome reaction, and even fertilization. But if you have a dysfunction or a, an alter, a genetic alteration uh, in the mitochondria, you may have a low production of ATP, but especially a higher production of uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, and this is, uh, uh, may be related to uh, an alteration of the function of the sperm. So uh, this cartoon was also shown before. You, you see uh, on the right what happens in normal conditions, so the normal production of reactive oxygen species, and what happens on the left when you have an abnormal mitochondrial function with an increased level of reactive oxygen species, okay? So again, we have, uh, again, Daniela Zuccarello, uh, published one of the first papers related to this. So mutations in uh, genes uh, coding for proteins of the mitochondria. And now we have also a lot of uh, more information. And especially we are looking now uh, if we have modification, and especially in the number, in the number, not the mutation of deletion, but in the number of DNA mut uh, mitochondria in the sperm. That is also related to another interesting field uh, of our group that are sperm telomeres. What uh, uh, sperm telomeres are very important, I have no time in, uh, today to talk about this, but they are really um, related to sperm function, especially uh, with sperm motility and DNA fragmentation. Uh, but now we are putting together this information. So now we are uh, trying to understand how sperm telomere length 
is related to mitochondrial DNA function and mitochondrial DNA copy number variation, uh, and also obviously with the reactive oxygen species. So I show you that just very, very preliminary data because we, uh, we are uh, now, th this data are based only on 52 subjects. So in this man, uh, we measure the number of the, uh, the copy number of a mitochondrial DNA in the sperm, uh, spermatozoa um, uh, telomere length, DNA integrity, and the reactive oxygen. And you see that there are some interesting relation between all these parameters. For example, the copy number, so the, the, the amount of mitochondrial DNA is related to sperm telomere, is related to DNA fragmentation, and obviously is related to uh, sperm motility. So you can understand that it's very a complex mechanism, including telomeres, mitochondrial function, and the genetic uh, uh, content, uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, and so on. And you can also imagine that all these things are related to epigenetics, but I have no time for this. Uh, this is just uh, an analysis showing that, uh, for example, the copy number, the amount of DNA or the mitochondrial DNA is uh, a very good predictor of sperm parameter, parameters, okay? These are very preliminary data. So in conclusion, uh, I say that uh, <coughs> male infertility is obviously a complex uh, multifactorial condition, but in which genetic factors are very, very frequent. Uh, and probably uh, a large amount of what we now call the idiopathic infertility will not be more idiopathic uh, in a few years. Uh, we have to move from the classical genetic view of nuclear gene defects to mitochondria, DNA, uh, to mitochondria, to genes responsible encoding for uh, mitochondrial proteins, for uh, uh, proteins of the flagellum, sperm telomeres, and so on. Uh, and finally, uh, this, uh, uh, the modern diagnostic approach that should be uh, based uh, as for the other genetic uh, uh, part, other genetic disease, uh, not based on single gene analysis or a single test, but uh, on uh, uh, with this new gen genomic uh, uh, possibility with gene panel analysis uh, for hypogonotropic hypogonadism, gene panel for uh, primary testiculopathy, gene panel for astenothospermia, and so on. Thank you very much. This is my group uh, in uh, Padova, and I hope to be in time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have the discussion at the end. Uh, so, no introduction needed for Antonio Capalbo. Uh, I invite him to, to the podium, and uh, he will speak on maternal effect genes uh, and oocyte embryo competence. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Filigori, and a uh, big thank to Andrea, Giovanni, and all the organizing um, for, for uh, this very much appreciated invitation. I'm between you and the dinner, so I'll try to, to keep it uh, short and on time. Um, I'm being asked to talk about um, new knowledge that we're gathering about genes uh, that are involved in very specific um, infertility endophenotypes that are characterized by specific defects during oocyte or embryo uh, maturation, and then we can use uh, possibly in the future, as Alberto was saying, to uh, reduce that um, proportion of infertility that is actually unexplained today. So all this concept stems from the, 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 the concept in, uh, by itself of genomic medicine that is usually referred as the primary uh, when we use the genomic variation and genomic considerations as primary um, factors to determine the diagnosis and the best treatment option for uh, a given disease without many consideration to environmental uh, factors of uh, lifestyle variability. So if we uh, try to translate this concept to a specific moment of life, which is the preconception stage, we can still, we can already start to see many potential clinical useful application of genomic medicine when applied in the preconceptional stage. Um, one of those is for sure expanded carry screening. This is a very well established uh, technology and strategies in order to inform couples about their career status for recessive genetic diseases in order to um, enhance and improve and empower reproductive autonomy of couples that can get to know 
uh, being at increased risk for one of the thousands possible recessive genetic conditions. This is a very established practice in many countries worldwide, and of course uh, not uh, as developed in many, in many others. Uh, what I'm going to, to focus more today is about the use of the genetic information that we gather in the preconception stage, um, also to improve infertility diagnosis and management. Uh, today, the field of genetics is moving towards genomics, meaning to say that the vast majority of the analysis that we perform today can be performed by all exon sequencing, that means sequencing the whole uh, coding sequence of our genome, and uh, developing then specific in silico gene panels in order to target specific ind indication or uh, diagnostic questions. So um, it is becoming more and more common that patients, for instance, going through IVF or having, uh, I mean, genetic testing for whatever other indication, uh, they may do that by all exome sequencing, and therefore we can have all the backend information of the exome to explore further uh, the clinical utility of genomics, particularly in this context of reproductive medicine. Now, <clears throat> we have already reviewed uh, in the presentation of Alberto many um, new discoveries, new genes uh, for what concern male infertility that are also leading to some translation and uh, uh, new application. For instance, for non-absorptive azospermia, we have seen that we can test before the surgical procedure genes involved in, um, uh, in maturation arrest of the sperm in order to avoid any potential uh, hopeless surgical procedure. In the for female infertility, the situation is a little bit more complex. Uh, as women uh, are usually, and um, like for conditions like POI or PCOS or endometriosis, this is a combination of monogenic, polygenic, and uh, environmental factors, and, uh, uh, um, and uh, also here we are experiencing a rise in the knowledge in the genetic association studies that are, I mean, going towards um, an increased prediction uh, for, for the development of these specific diseases. What I'm going to focus today uh, more in particular is a very uh, specific uh, infertility and phenotype that we can visualize only throughout an IVF treatment cycle that is impossible to detect or to visualize during spontaneous intercourse because this is uh, the phenotype here is characterized during an IVF treatment cycle when we can visualize our oocyte and we can visualize specific de defects up happening during oocyte maturation or during embryonic development. So these are really specific um, IVF infertility and the phenotype that we can, where we can try today uh, to predict and to investigate further their genetic basis. Now, <clears throat> these are... Um, I mean, rare conditions to happen, rare phenotypes, I would say. And, uh, but I think it's experience of all of you to, to have encountered patients where you had all image oocyte. Alessio this morning was showing the uh, total fertilization failure, and that this is also a recurrent event, meaning to say that you should have a kind of genetic background, or having all uh, embryos that fail to develop to the blastoid stage in multiple IVF treatment cycles. Much of the effort here has been invested during the last um, uh, years of investigation in genomics, trying to underpin genes associated with these phenotypes, has been invest on the analysis of a uh, female genome because we know that maternal effort genes are the ones that are usually controlling all the final steps of oocyte maturation uh, as well as all the uh, early embryogenesis. Therefore, all, most of the data that, and the, the, the genetic association studies that were performed so far uh, were directed towards the analysis of the female genome. This is a landmark paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016. Um, here they address uh, and they investigated uh, and they performed a genetic association with this phenotype of oocyte maturation arrest and they uh, kind of shown in that in um, 24 families, seven out of the, these 24 families, there was a pathogenic variant in a specific gene, that is two bed gene. Um, they performed functional analysis, as you can see here in this slide, and they could show, and they can confirm the causal association of this gene with the phenotype of maturation arrest, because as you can see here, two bed gene is one of the major constituent of the meiotic spindle, and uh, in this figure, you can clearly see how the meiotic spindle was disrupted by any specific mutation that was uh, investigated in these functional studies. In the year that followed, uh, we had many uh, new uh, studies and genes that were associated at different levels with uh, oocyte maturation defects and with uh, early embryonic developmental failure. Um, most of the genes cluster into a specific 
subcortical maternal complex that is an essential multiprotein complex uh, that is vital and fundamental for uh, oocyte maturation and for early developmental uh, arrest. Um, however, I need to, uh, I mean, if we want to be a little bit critical on these studies, we can see that most of these studies were performed in a single ethnicity, so they were performed in, 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 in China or by using women of uh, a single Asian ethnicity. Um, there, there are other limitations that we can see in these studies, such as, for instance, the, the class definition of the phenotype. This is the, one of the most important points that was touched upon by LS also this morning. If we have three oocytes that fail to fertilize, this can be due by chance, can be due by the embryologists, that for, that, for whatever reason it happened. So we need to establish statistically grounded methodologies in order to define the phenotype. In genetics, the most import, one of the most important parameters is to clearly define well the phenotype before performing genetic association studies. And in many of these papers, this wasn't really um, done properly. Then there are other technical details about the bioinformatic pipelines and uh, the functional validations, how this was performed, but I'm not going to, uh, to go through it. Um, what we did uh, in our experience so far in order to overcome some of these limitations was to first develop a statistical methodology in order to identify outliers for some specific parameters of interest, such as oocyte maturation, uh, um, uh, oocyte fertilization, or blastocyst development, adjusting also for some important variable, like female age for blastocyst development. And by leveraging uh, a very large data set of IVF cycles, we could have uh, selected, we selected uh, 28 families, 28 women that were indeed showing a statistically significant deviation from what was the benchmark or the uh, normal value uh, for these parameters. We looked uh, and we had 28 women consenting for the study for having uh, all exon sequencing performed. We developed a specific bioinformatic pipeline. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, this specific bioinformatic pipeline was including also control data set of fertile women, so it was kind of robust uh, against false positive results. And also, uh, this um, pipeline usually were uh, giving priority to some specific genes that we know they are important for this biological function of oocyte maturation and embryo development, but it was also agnostically open to retain new gene disease association. Um, what we observed at the end was that our diagnostic yield in these 28 women was seven, 7 out of 28, which means 25%, which is, is, that is quite remarkable in, uh, in, in genetic diagnostic. Usually when we get 25-30% uh, of diagnostic yield for a given phenotype, we, we usually are quite happy. Uh, but of course there is still a world to explore here um, for improving and boosting this diagnostic uh, yield. Why I'm so um, passionate about this topic and why I'm a little bit confident that we, we still have uh, a way to go and a way to improve uh, this diagnostic yield because if we look at all um, population genomics data that we have today, this is the largest um, data set of genomic sequence uh, information for one million individuals with different ethnicities, still not published, is on Bioarchive. Uh, but by analyzing uh, all the genome and all the coding sequence of our genome, and by looking also uh, across the different ethnicities, you, we can see that there are at least 3,500 genes that are intolerant to loss of function. What does that mean? It means that these genes are never mutated in the general population, or these genes are essential for cellular uh, progression, cellular development in vitro. So these genes, at least some of them, they should have something to deal with infertility, and in particular with early embryonic lethality. And these are our targets to continue in this investigation because, I mean, we, we think that there is still um, uh, a, way, uh, a way to go and a lot to explore. Now, a couple of days ago, uh, we had this publication on science, and I wanted to make just a, a quick comment on this, because sometimes there is this common belief that genetics is a very mature field, uh, that genomics is, is for everyone, for every indication. Genetics is extremely complex, and I think personally that we are still in infancy. It's still a very rudimental, uh, we still use rudimental approaches for variant annotation, variant classification. is done individually by every person in the world that can go there and give and assign the pathogenicity to a variant. So uh, also from, from the perspective of um, understanding the clinical meaning of the genomic variation in our genome, I think there is, we are still at the beginning and there is a huge way to improve. Uh, here, this publication, they have applied the first 
uh, artificial intelligence models from Google, as you can see here, DeepMind, um, and they, they show that for the missense variants, they could classify 80% of them in either benign or pathogenic, which is usually, in our experience, missense variants are always classified as variant of unknown significance, and they could actually uh, give a prediction, meaning to say that the diagnostic yield and the accuracy of the genomics diagnosis is just um, likely to, to, to be uh, improved significantly in the next years. So <laughs> getting to this point, you can say, okay, this is very cool. Uh, so what? What do we do with this information? If we can make a genetic association with these um, outset maturation or embryo developmental defects, what, what, what do we do? How do we, uh, what, where is the, the clinical utility? How we can use this information to improve patient outcomes? So here you have listed, I think, all the, the levels, the different levels of clinical utilities that we can identify in this type of genetic diagnosis. But I want to just to give you um, a few couple of examples. Like here you have the example of PADI6. PADI6 is a gene that was associated with embryo developmental arrest. The embryos in many different families um, fail to develop beyond the day two or day three of, of development. However, PADI6 is a gene that is very well known also in clinical genetics because uh, it is uh, causative of multilocus imprinting uh, defects in the newborns as well as in recurrent miscarriages. Uh, caused by uh, polyploid conceptions. So as you can see, these genes provide very wide expansion and broad expansion of the phenotypes, and uh, uh, we can use this information in the preconception stage not only to inform about the infertility itself, but also to inform to, uh, about the risk for uh, long-term neonatal or obstetrical outcome, uh, neonatal outcomes. Um, another uh, way where we can find uh, benefit of this application in the field of reproductive medicine is no doubt um, the egg donation cycles. Uh, donors, uh, I mean, are good candidates because they are young, not because uh, they are fertile. Usually we do not have information about the fertility status of these women. We just select them because they are normal and because they are young and because they have a normal hormonal profile on anatomical um, and medical assessment. But it does, doesn't mean that these women are not going to experience uh, infertility uh, in, in, in the future. So uh, another way is, of course, to perform this kind of analysis and to see and to investigate and to use genetics in order to identify those donors that may uh, turn out to be uh, infertile due to, to these specific um, uh, infertility defects. Uh, this will have help, of course, the management of egg donation cycles, but also improve uh, the cost effectiveness of this procedure. Also, genetics is a static analysis like uh, genetic doesn't change uh, in our life. So as long and if we, we will be able to develop predictive markers, genetic markers for infertility, uh, of course, this can be applied at any age and can become, uh, why not one day, a screening test also for the general population when there is still time to take preventive and uh, corrective measures. Another example that I wanted to highlight about clinical utility is the case of tryptertin. Tryptertin, uh, again, was associated with those at maturation or rest. Um, and in this paper, uh, what the author did was to uh, take a woman that was carrier of mutation and pathogenic variant in these genes, make a new stimulation cycles, and randomize the immature oocyte, the M1 oocyte, to receive either uh, no uh, treatment or to receive an experimental treatment based on the injection of a complementary RNA sequence for the tryptertin gene. So these eggs, some eggs were randomized to receive the uh, antisense of the RNA for the tryptertin genes and are the ones that then uh, show maturation, normal fertilization and development to the blastoid stage. Um, all the others that were not injected, uh, uh, they stayed uh, at the M1 stage. So this is just a proof of concept. Of course, there is any safety data, any clinical val validation is just a proof of concept saying that while learning these um, genetic and biological um, factors that are uh, imposing barrier to conception uh, with, by, I mean, having specific uh, block during development, we can also devise and try to think to develop new molecular uh, targets and, ther and therapeutics approach in order to overcome this, this, this barrier. 
Now, uh, the last point that I want uh, to touch upon was indeed introduced uh, by Professor Pellissier this morning, uh, and I think uh, genetics here, genomics here is a very uh, fundamental part of uh, uh, going uh, towards a more holistic view and approach to infertility and to uh, couples uh, that are, I mean, in this specific moment of life, that is the moment where we're trying to uh, conceive. And um, I think uh, today we have um, unquestionable evidence about the fact that infertility is not an isolated condition. Um, we have epidemiological studies consistently showing that both men, infertile men and infertile women, they have a significantly higher risk of developing other chronic diseases later on in life, including cancer, cardio cardiovascular and metabolic syndromes. And also, uh, I, I was shocked to see that uh, also the life expectancy of infertile women in many different studies and many different big registries from US or for other countries is shorter as compared to um, the fertile control individuals. Meaning to say the mortality rate of infertile women is um, much higher and the life expectancy is lower. So I think uh, we should take this, um, this data seriously and we should try to understand at least um, where are these risks and uh, if we can detect it early on time and if we can develop and devise any uh, preventive measure in order to, to alleviate um, this issue. So we know that um, also from a biological and genetic perspective, we have this pleiotropy um, effects like many uh, pathways are in common in the reproductive axis as well as with many other organs and functions. Uh, for instance, the DDR pathway is fundamental for all the reproductive processes, but also in cancer, for instance. And um, therefore, I think that uh, we need to also use this type of preconception genomic screening in order to identify risk factors that may predispose to future health uh, problems. Um, this is the last paper I want to show. Uh, again, it's a, a New England Journal of Medicine paper where uh, they analyze all the very well-known medically actionable genes that are reported by the CMG, by all the societies, to be associated with chronic diseases, cancer, and many others. So these are genes very well validated to be causative and to increase the risk for these diseases. And in this analysis, the authors went and looked at the, uh, what, what is the carrier burden for these genes in women that were uh, diagnosed with unexplained infertility. Um, the population average, the carrier rate, the carrier burden of um, these genes in the population is 2%. In this study, they have reported 17% of carrier burden in women that, were, uh, that have received a diagnosis of unexplained infertility, which is, I mean, uh, amazing. It is, I mean, a very, uh, uh, I mean, impressive data. And uh, in, if confirmed, there are limitations in the study, of course, but if confirmed and corroborated, I think this will uh, result in an unquestionable indication for genetic testing uh, for these genes to all women that are suffering today with unexplained infertility. So in conclusion, this is um, where preconception genomic medicine uh, can find a place and can find uh, clinical useful application for our, uh, for our women. And uh, I feel very excited um, that we are at the from forefront of this, of this research. And uh, of course, we, 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 we hope and we have the capabilities today to, to study and to perform big data analysis also within our group. And uh, I really hope that we will uh, be able to, to bring some element of novelty and some new uh, therapeutic option for our patients in the, in the year to come. Um, I acknowledge all the uh, fantastic team of Juno, uh, friends and colleagues for their passion and uh, their uh, friendship. And um, I would like just to uh, remind uh, that uh, we're gonna have a, a meeting, a very interesting meeting on this subject, on these topics in uh, November in Florence, uh, in Ashere Campus, so you are all very welcome to attend. Thank you very much for listening. Well, so uh, the discussion is open. So please, uh, Alberto, come to the podium. So if there's any question. 
Well, if not, let me ask you some very brief question to, to, to Alberto. Actually, I agree with uh, Antonio that the, the real issue here is the lab to <laughs> bedside the translation of this information. I mean, how do you use this information? For instance, let me ask Alberto, if, if you, are you actually, how do you use this genetic information with your male infertility patients? So do, do you actually tell some of them that they should not to ICSI, for instance, which may solve the problem and uh, result in pregnancy if there is something that can be genetically transmitted? Uh, I think that there are two, at least two aspects that we should consider. The first one is to have a correct diagnosis. So uh, if we identify a genetic uh, cause, we identify the specific cause of this infertility. And this is some, is, a, is important, okay? Per se, is important. Uh, the other important thing is that many of these genes that are uh, especially those involved in uh, uh, sperm motility and uh, the proteins, uh, encoding for the proteins of the chile and flagello, uh, may have also general health consequences. Uh, the third aspect, is that uh, these, gene, these mutations or these genetic anomalies can be passed uh, to uh, the offsprings. Uh, so genetic counseling uh, should uh, uh, be performed just to uh, inform uh, in the, uh, the patient, the couples, about the risk of transmission, the risk for future health, and so on. So we know also that um, for many of these genes, uh, we do not have still this information. So what happens? Uh, if the mutation is transmitted. So now we have the information that uh, uh, the identification of the genetic factor is important for the diagnosis and to inform the couple. And, but since many of these uh, have also consequences for the general health of this man and probably also for the offspring, I think uh, we have also prognostic factors important. Another curiosity before to, to leave the, the question to Andrea Borini for, uh, for Alberto. Uh, do you think that uh, also in presence of uh, some genetic alteration, the andrologist can uh, do something to improve the reproductive outcome? So you mean that the identification of the genetic factors uh, uh, do not allow us to treat this man? Uh, yes, probably yes, especially for uh, those mutations, those genes that are responsible for stem cell uh, differentiation and spermatogonial stem cell differentiation and spermatogonial mitosis. For example, the classical Y chromosome microdeletions. So if we know that a patient has a Y chromosome microdeletion, we, okay, we have no treatment. You can give FSH, but you have no results because there is a genetic defects. But for other problems, uh, the effect is not uh, on-off. So there is a modulation of the effect of the genetic factors modulated by other factors. So for example, if you have a man with low motility of sperm and some mutations, but not causing absolute absence of motility, and you have an obese man with this mutation, if you uh, lose weight, you can also ameliorate uh, the sperm uh, phenotype. Thank you, Alberto. Please, yeah. uh, Dr. Well, Morin. Yeah, I think Andrea has a it, question. It, it, it is just in the same direction. So what I, what I mean is, uh, of course, it is important to understand if it's a genetic uh, disease. So if the genes are the, the origin of the defects, uh, a lot of therapy are not important. I am thinking of the integrators, all the stuff that most of the men get uh, every time that they have uh, just low count or low motility. So probably it is important for this. Then uh, you said that, of course, you can also do something if it's just uh, a, not only the, the problem of the, the gene defect. So, Yes, w w what it is important is uh, now uh, we have a lot of genetic factors that can uh, modulate uh, the phenotype. So it is not the classical Klinefelter syndrome or men with Y chromosome microdeletion. So there are many mutations in genes that can uh, higher the risk 
but not causing uh, absolutely this defect. So it may be a cofactor with other lifestyle or other with an infection or with uh, other conditions. Uh, there are also some uh, in polymorphins, for example, that help us in selecting the treatment. For example, polymorphin the FSH beta and FSH receptor genes, because we know that there are some polymorphisms for which uh, subjects may respond better to FSH treatment than another. So this is also another important aspect of pharmacogenomics. Another hand by Dr. Zuccarello, please. I have a question for Antonio. <laughs> so get back to Antonio. Do you think it's time? to include the genes you mentioned uh, in the carrier screening test for donors? I think not yet. Um, I think we need uh, validation data and different ethnicities. Um, the field of clinical genomics has already experienced uh, to see some genes that are indeed causative of some disease in a specific population, but not in others. So I think, I think we need to confirm these findings in a, I mean, pan-ethnic way, uh, see, understand a little bit better the molecular pathology of these genes, what are the, uh, I mean, the role of the mutation, and, uh, but I think, I think it's, it's, not, it's not too far. Like, we only need to have uh, big data, because you know that you need big data, very well controlled phenotype and medical records uh, together with uh, exon sequencing data. And, uh, and, to, I mean, and to confirm this preliminary, preliminary funding. Uh, I think if I can expand a little bit on the question of Professor Filigori about uh, why sometimes genetic is not used or is not uh, as some barriers for application. I think carry screening is a perfect example. Like there's no doubt about the utility of carry screening for testing recessive diseases before pregnancy shouldn't also be applied only to women undergoing IVF or to couples undergoing IVF. It can be potentially applied to all population, especially young, young couples. They have higher risk of having a child affected by recessive diseases than for Down syndrome. But this is not practiced in our country as in many other countries. So I think genetics uh, is not only a matter of developing uh, scientific knowledge or clinical knowledge, but also a matter of developing frameworks for application and for delivering the tests uh, into our society, like uh, improving our genetic counseling, improving our genetic education, so building uh, infrastructure that are permissive for uh, a more application at scale of genetics. Thank you. Thanks. If there are no more questions, I think that we can we close uh, the session and the day. And we wait uh, all of you tomorrow morning, 8.30, because we will talk about sperm. Bye-bye. <laughs>